append sheets, not Excel tables in Power Query. We have proper data sets on each sheet, but they're not in Excel tables. We can't use Excel.CurrentWorkbook because it doesn't access a worksheet. So what do we do when we want to append all these sheets into one proper data set? We can switch over to the Excel.Workbook function. That function has no problem importing sheets. But there's three problems. The first is, what happens if we add or take away records? The second is, what if we have data somewhere else in the worksheet? And the third thing is, that function will be pointing at the entire workbook, which requires a file path. And if we move this Excel workbook to somewhere else, that file path is broken. Now, the obvious answer is Excel Magitrix 1622, where we just converted each one of the tables to an Excel table object. And then we use Excel.CurrentWorkbook. None of those three problems occur when the data is in an Excel table object. But if you really need to access sheets of data, append them in the same workbook, that's what this video is about. Now, the structure of this Excel workbook, we have three sheets with data, and we can add as many sheets as we want later. But we have one worksheet named Report. This is where we're going to create our pivot table. And this is where we're going to dynamically create the file path. That way, wherever we move this file, we'll have the new file path here. Then we can import that into Power Query and use it inside of Excel.Workbook. All right, in cell N2, we're going to use an Excel worksheet formula. And we're going to use the great function cell. If we say, hey, cell, look at the file name. And we have to comma and anchor this using a cell reference somewhere in the spreadsheet so that cell doesn't give us an error. Now, if I enter this, hey, look, there's the file path. Now, we don't need the sheet name, and we definitely don't need those square brackets. So we're going to remove all of that. But first, we need to find the position of that square bracket. And I'm going to copy this, Control-C, because we're going to use it twice. And I'm going to say, hey, let's search for find text in double quotes. We're looking for that close square bracket, comma, within that text, close parentheses. Now, that's one position too many, so I subtract one. So we need to take from the left, from the text, Control V, that's our cell formula, comma, and then there's our number of characters. So that way, we've removed everything, square bracket and sheet name. Now all we need to do is remove that open square bracket. That's where we can use substitute. There's the text. At the end, comma, the old text is in double quotes, open square bracket, comma, and then double quote, double quote with nothing between it represents nothing to us. So it will replace that with nothing. And there's our dynamic file path. I'm going to save this. I closed it, moved it, and when I open it back up, it knows the exact file path for this file. That helps us deal with problem number three. Now, rather than using the Excel table feature to bring this into Power Query, I'm going to hover over the name box with N2 selected and type File Path, Enter, to create a defined name. Now, if I go up to Data, Get and Transform, the From Table button will bring this defined name into the Power Query editor. So clicking From Table, that's a fine name. I do not want either of these steps. I only want source. If we look up in the formula bar, Excel.CurrentWorkbook is what we use to bring in define names, Excel tables, but not Excel worksheets. Now, I want to access this as a text string. So I could right click, drill down, but that adds an extra step, and I don't want to do that. Now, this is delivering a table. And we need to do a two-way lookup. We need to tell this formula right here the row number and the column number. The way we extract a particular row from a table is by using the positional index operators. Now, this is the first row, but in Power Query, the first row is 0. So when I put a 0, this will extract the first record. Now we have a record. To complete our two-way lookup, we now need to, in square brackets, put our field name. So I come to the end square brackets field name, and Enter. Now we have our file path. Over on the right, we have our query. The problem is if I use that file path in another query, I risk formula.firewall error. 
So the way we get around that is we're actually going to pull the file into Power Query from that file path, land it, and then we'll refer to it in the next query. So up in the formula bar, how do we get a file from a file path? We say, hey, file.content. It's amazing in Power Query how smartly they named a lot of these functions. Delete, delete. Now at the end, I close parentheses. And when I hit Enter, now I have the entire Excel file with all of the objects in that file. Now I have the actual workbook that I'm living in and all of its objects, including all the sheets, here in the Power Query window. Now we need to close and load, close and load to, and load this only as a connection. Click OK. Now I can double click to open this back up. On the right, right click Reference. Immediately, I'm going to hit F2, and we're going to call this Append Sheets and Enter. Now we have an Excel workbook with all the objects. And the way we get all of the objects from that Excel workbook is we use Excel.workbook. When I open parentheses, notice it says it needs a workbook, which is exactly what the file path query is delivering. Delete, delete. Now close parentheses and watch what happens when I hit Enter. I get a table, and the kind column tells us what kind of object it found in that Excel workbook. A bunch of sheets, there's a defined name. There could also be tables in this column. Now we want to go look at the data column, because each one of these rows contains a table object. And oh no, look at that. The field names are actually the first record. Well, luckily, Excel.workbook has a second argument. If I type a comma, whoa, use headers. You have to type true, but all lowercase. Now, don't hit Enter here. This is IntelliSense, and it doesn't work very well in Power Query. Click at the end, and then hit Enter. And now we have exactly what we want. Those are the worksheets with our proper data sets. Now, we do need to filter this table because we only want sheet objects. And we don't want, for the item column, the sheet with the name report. So under kind, I'm going to click the filter dropdown. Notice there's two items. So when I uncheck define name, up in the formula bar, it will say, please only have the kind of object that's equal to a sheet. Over in the item, we use Filter drop down, And now notice there's many items when I uncheck Report. Now, because there's multiple items, it'll say, hey, from the column that contains the name of the objects, we do not want an object named Report. Now, at this point, we could append. But what I'd like to do is notice this table object. And it only has four rows. I want to save this as a connection only before we load it to a pivot table. And I want to go make some mistakes in the worksheet. And look at what shows up here in Power Query. Once we see that, we can figure out a way to fix it. So I'm going to go up to Close and Load, Close and Load 2, Only Create a Connection, click OK. Now the first thing we want to do, go over to Data One Sheet, and we want to test to see if we can add new records. All right, so I added a new record. I can't immediately go over and double click, because guess what? This query right here is looking at the saved file. So one thing we're always going to have to do if we want the new data to be reflected in our query is to Control S and Save. Now when I double click and open this up, look at the first table. Wow, that is cool. So I'm definitely allowed to add records to the data set. Now I'm going to close and load. What happens if we delete Control S? Double click and open this up. Look at the first table. Uh-oh. Null values. Now, this problem will actually fix at the end, because we can use a built-in feature to remove blank records. But let's close and load and see the other problem that can happen. Let's say we come over to the side and we add some node, or we have formulas, or whatever over here. Control S. Well, of course, this is a worksheet. So when I double click and open this up and look at that first table, it's trying to be polite. It definitely brought in that data. But look at this, column 4, column 5. So somehow we want to build a safeguard in to remove these type of columns if someone accidentally does this. Now remember, neither one of these problems would occur if we were using Excel tables. 
But since we want to use sheets, we're going to, from this data column that contains tables, we're going to add an extra column here that will remove any fields that start with the word column. Now this trick right here, of course, I learned from the Power Query poet and artist, Bill Sizzes. Now we go up to Add Column, Custom Column. We're going to name this new column something like Remove Fields with Column. Now because we have tables in each row, we can use table.column names. Open parentheses. There's our data column. Double click. Close parentheses. And now table.columns, as it copies down, can extract column names or field names. When we click OK, the result is a list. And each item in the list is one of the column names. Now from this list of column names, I want to select only items in the list when the text item does not start with column. So we're going to come up to the formula bar. And so far, we have one nested function inside of another function. Now table.addColumns has three arguments. That's the name of the previous step where it's adding a column. That's the name of the column. And the third argument is a function. We happen to have a built-in function here, and we're using the each keyword. Now this each keyword is shorthand for a custom function. Each allows us to access the table in each row. And when we get to extracting a single column, all we have to do is list the field name in square brackets. The problem is, is we're going to have multiple functions, and we're going to have multiple occurrences of the word each. So sometimes that's confusing. So rather than use each, we'll simply define our own custom function. Open parentheses, and the variable we're going to define to access the table in each row is the letter t. That letter t is associated with the function table.addColumn. Now after the letter T, we use the go to operator, equal sign, greater than symbol, and a space. And instead of just using the field name, we actually have to explicitly use the variable. When I put a T here, that means please get the table from each row and use the data column. Now that construction right there is exactly the same as each without all of that and just data. When I hit Enter, I get exactly the same thing. Now the advantage is that we will have an explicit variable for each one of our functions that uses, in one of its arguments, a function. In that way, it can be easier to read. Now our next goal, since that's a list of column names, is we need to select from that list. So right after the go to operator, list.select. Now open parentheses, and notice the first argument is a list which is exactly what we have, a list of field names. Now I'm going to come to the end in backspace and comma to get to the second argument in list.select. And sure enough, there's a function. So instead of using each, I'm going to define a variable that will allow us to access each item in that list. Now what's in the list? Column names. So the variable I'm going to define is CN for column names. This is our second variable we've defined. And that CN is associated with the list.select function. Then we do our go to operator. And what do I want to do to each row? I want to find text column names that start with, and then open parentheses. The first argument is, well, I need the items from the list. So that's where our variable goes, CN, comma. And there's the substring I'm looking for, in double quotes, column, in double quotes. Now we have close parentheses on text.starts with, close parentheses on list.select, close on table.addColumns. And when I hit Enter, I'm not going to get quite what I want, but it sort of worked. That gave me the columns that start with the word column. So what do I do? I want the opposite of that. So before text.starts with, I use the not operator, all lowercase. Come to the end and Enter. And now I get exactly what I want, column names that don't start with column. All the way down, I get the correct list of column names. Now we can use these correct field names to select the correct columns from each one of these tables. Up in the formula bar, after the variable t, we want to select columns. So we type table.selectColumns. Open parentheses. The first argument requires a table. That's table t from there. So in the first argument, we type our variable t, square bracket, data column. And now when I type a comma, 
the second argument of table.selectColumns is a list of columns. And there, we already have that list. So I come to the end, close parentheses, and now when I hit Enter, we have a table with only the correct columns selected for each table in each row. That solves problem number two. Now looking at our formula, we defined the variable t. That's associated with table.addColumn. We use that two places in our formula, in the first argument of table select columns and in the first argument of table column names. The second variable we defined was cn. That was in the second argument of list.select. And we used that variable inside of text.startsWith. Now we have our column of proper data sets, and we simply need to append. We could use this button right there. But if I select this button, uncheck this, click OK, notice up in the formula bar, it hard codes the field names in. So rather than do it that way, notice this is a table. That's a field name. So if I come up to f of x, it automatically lists the name of the previous step to extract that column right there. I use our field access operators, square brackets, and then type the field name. When we hit Enter, we have as a list each one of our proper data sets. Now we come up here and use the function table.combine. Backspace, backspace, and notice the argument is table as list. That's exactly what we have close parentheses, and Enter. Now we're almost there. We just need to remove null records. So we come up to Remove Rows. And there it is, Remove Blank Rows. And that last step right there and that formula solves our first problem. Now we're going to click Close and Load because it's already loaded as a connection. Right click, Load To. And now we want to load it to a pivot table report. This loads it directly to the pivot table cache. Click OK. Now I'm going to drag product down to rows, sales down to values, just a simple pivot table. Because now look what happens. When I add a new record, I come over. Remember, I have to Control S and then right click Refresh. If I add a whole new sheet of data, come over Control S, right click Refresh. That's pretty amazing. All right, here's your bonus trick. Now, because we have to save and then refresh, if we want to automate that, we can record a macro and add a button. I'm going to use the F12 key, because we have to change the file extension to .xlsm, save the file, then close, open it back up, develop a ribbon, record macro, give it a smart name, click OK, Control S, right click, refresh the query, stop the macro. Add a button, click and draw, click OK, add a smart name to the button. Now if I come down and add new data, I simply click my button and everything updates. All right, in this video we saw how to use an Excel worksheet formula to dynamically get the file name. We then wanted to take data from different sheets, append it. We created a first query to land the Excel file. Then we created a query, notably with this formula, to help transform the tables, appended them all together, created a pivot table report, and then a button to help us update. Now, if you want to learn more about M code, here's an awesome video from the MSPTDA class. And if you want to see how to do this with Excel tables, check out 1622.